in service. We are excited to be back in God's house to study God's word. Good morning, Sister Betty. Sister Betty always says good morning when she comes on. Good morning, Sister Sandra Ross. Good morning to all of you who are here in Sunday school this morning. I don't know if you know it, but it's a blessing to be alive. These numbers are consistently surging, but God has blessed every one of us to be alive. And we definitely appreciate God for his mercy and his grace toward us. We thank God for our pastor who is here with us this morning. Lord bless you. We are thankful uh, for this opportunity to be in the house of the Lord. The Lord has so wonderfully blessed us and we owe him the praise, we owe him the glory, the honor that belongs to him. Let's have a word of prayer and then we're going to get started with our lesson momentarily. Dear God in heaven, again, we thank you and we praise you. We give you glory and honor. We want to thank you, God, for all things, all of your blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Thank you, God, for life, our health, our strength. We thank you for the church family, loved ones, our own family members. Yes, God. Lord, how you are keeping us even in this troublous time, this pandemic, Lord, uh, that we are dealing with. We're here, God, because of you. And we thank you. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you for your many blessings. Lord, we thank you for our health, our strength, we thank you, God, for yes, your goodness, God. your mercy. You let us go to bed last night and you kept us throughout the night. Yes. Lord. You didn't let our houses catch on fire. You didn't let God, the robber God. come in. And we are thankful, Lord. We've been traveling in and out of town and around the city. Yes. You kept us, Lord, giving us traveling mercy. We thank you. Lord, we just thank you. And we pray, God, that this day, Lord, that you will bless your people. But we need a word from heaven today. We, yes. we need a touch, God. We, we need to be renewed. We need to be revived. Help us, Lord, that we may draw closer to you. Lord, that we may do your will, that we be in your perfect will. Help us, Lord. For yes. We want to please you in all that we do. Yes, God. In, the in the name of Jesus. Let every one of us examine ourselves, Lord, to see where we stand. Let every one of us. Oh, God, even see ourselves where you see us, that we don't try to hide anything. Lord, help us now. Help me, Lord. Yes, Lord. In, the In the name of Jesus. We pray for miracles today. The greatest miracle is that of salvation, that yes, you will Lord. save those that are not saved. Lord, deliver from sin. Break the shackles, the yokes, oh, God. Yes, save our children, Lord. Save, Lord. Deliver save. from sin. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Jesus. Lord, let the sick be healed today. Yes, COVID-19, oh God, and from other illnesses yes, and diseases. Lord. Let your touch be upon them, oh God, yes, in the name of Jesus. Name of Jesus. Bless, oh God, the Sunday school time. Let the word be taught that we may grow, Lord, in your knowledge, your will, your way. Yes, For God, we want to know more about you. We want, we want to understand your word. We want to know, God, what we need to do. We want yes, to understand God. the power of the Holy Ghost. Yes, in the name of Jesus. Jesus. We love you, God. We praise you. Yes, God. We give you the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. All right. Don't forget to, uh, if you have a Facebook page, don't forget to like, comment, and share this feed. Somebody needs to hear about salvation. For all who believe this lesson is worth sharing. Want to do a homework check. Want to know with what two people did you share last week's lesson insights? That was our homework for last week. And with what two people did you share last week's homework assignment? Did you share the gospel with anyone? Whether it was on Facebook, by word of mouth, through a text. How did you um, share God's word, his message of salvation on last week. Well, this week we come back to see that there is salvation for all. We are right back in the book of Romans. We're right back in the book of Romans, and Romans is not the easiest book to study. That's why it's good to be in the company of believers so that we can lean on one another. And I'm definitely going to lean on Pastor this morning. Uh, I've read Romans many times. I've said in the past, and I tell you, 
it is still, after reading it many times, not the easiest book to understand. So with, with that being said, let's delve right into the lesson. We're going to get a little lesson background, I think, from Pastor this morning. I forgot. I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right. Uh, I forgot to um, give our lesson aim, which says, by the end of this lesson, we will support Paul's confidence in the salvation offered in Christ, feel justified through our faith in Christ, and embrace with joy the possibility for all. Uh, by the way, our, our subject is salvation for all who believe. Salvation for all who believe. Our life need for today's lesson. Many people lack confidence in addressing life's circumstances. How can one gain trust? Salvation comes to all who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and believe in their hearts. Now look at what life need for today's lesson says. Many people lack confidence in addressing life's circumstances. Listen, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to address, have to address life's circumstances without the God of heaven on my side. I don't know um, what tomorrow is going to hold. I don't know what next week is going to hold next year. But I know the God who holds tomorrow in his hand. And so because he lives, I can face any situation i thank god for salvation through jesus christ all right sister ross said their subject is seeking confidence seeking confidence all right at this time i'm going to turn it over to our pastor for background information well just uh briefly when you look at this uh chapter romans chapter 10 uh, subject again says salvation for all who believe then another uh, uh, group, their subject was salvation available for all. What this lesson is really is dealing with is the fact that the Apostle Paul uh, was trying to really convey the message over to the Jewish converts or to the Jewish people in general that salvation comes through Jesus and not of the law. Uh, and that was a very difficult thing for the Jews to accept because all these years, uh, you take from the time of Moses up to the time that we read in Romans chapter 10, the Jewish people, and this is past the time of Christ, his crucifixion, resurrection, the Jewish people were holding on dearly to the law of Moses, to all of the rituals, the ceremonies, and to the law itself. They just could not quite grasp the fact that uh, Christ had come as the God-man, died on the cross, and that he had risen from the grave, and that salvation came because of his death, burial, and resurrection. They wanted to continue to practice the principles of the law. They, and, and to do so, that means that you would be saved by works and not faith. Now keep in mind this, uh, Paul lets us know the law itself was not evil. That's not recorded in this particular lesson. The law itself is good because it shows the holiness of God, the righteousness of God. It's written down for us to know what God expects of us. But there is no way, and this lesson illustrates the fact that there's no way for man to be able to, to keep the law. No way we can satisfy the demands of the law. In order to do so, you would have to have a perfect life. And I mean by perfect life, uh, I'm, I'm saying that there'd be no flaws at all, no mistake, no error. Because remember, it was James that said that if you offend at one point, you will be guilty of all. So the only person that could keep the law perfectly was Jesus Christ himself. You know, And so in order for us to please God, we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot come through the law, but we have to go through Jesus. That is the blood of Jesus that cleanses, that washes us, or washes away our sin. Uh, through the blood of Jesus, our faith in Jesus, that, you know, he has what? His death has substituted for us. Uh, the, the death of Christ, it also allow the Spirit of God to come in to live within us so that we can live a righteous life. 
And so, uh, in doing so, uh, you know, you, you, people live about and heard me say the church is not something that is set up as a bunch of rules and regulations, the do's and the don'ts. Of course, when we get saved, we don't want to displease God. We're not throwing away the righteousness of God, or that is, uh, we're not saying that we have a license to sin, just rather as mentioned many times since we've been dealing with this. Uh, however, we must have our faith in Christ, that uh, the faith in Christ enables us to have the Spirit of God, which will help us to be obedient. Now, if you try to go the other way, because if you try to go through law, that means that you are denying Christ, actually, and that you will not have the Spirit of God to live within you uh, to help you to live this righteous life. And sometimes, Pastor, it can be so confusing. It can be so confusing. So I want to ask the question that many of us may have uh, or have had at one time before we fully understood. Why would the law be given if it was impossible to keep the law? Explain that again. Okay, you go back to the, uh, you go back to the book of Genesis, the book of Exodus, and you look at uh, Abraham, the patriarch, and then his sons, and so forth. Uh, remember, the Bible said that it was Abraham's faith that was counting him to righteousness. Um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Joseph, they did not have the written law of God to, to know everything that was necessary against God's holiness. Let me put it this way. All right? But they had faith in God. They trusted God. And that was counted to their righteousness. Now, I just talked about this, this point here uh, when I was dealing with the judgment seat of Christ and, and, and more so this past week, the great white throne judgment. Then in the judgment, we are going to be judged according to our knowledge. Those people who lived before the law, uh, before the time of Moses, are going to be judged differently than those people past the law. Because the people that had, who had the law, they had it in black and white, so to speak as to what was right and what was wrong, if you follow what I'm saying here. So uh, that's why God gave us the law. Uh, Paul said, I think it was in the book of Galatians, that the law was our schoolmaster. All right, it was there to teach us, to train us. But the, the one thing that the law could not do, the law could not save us. The law told us what was right, what was wrong, and if you broke the law, the penalty was death. It had no power to keep you, but it did tell you what was right and what was wrong. That's, that's, the, important, that's the importance of the law. So even then, I think here's a point that, that sometimes we miss. Those saints of the Old Testament who were saved, they still had to have faith. They yet had to believe and trust in God. Now, what did they do? Because they had to be uh, a sacrifice for the for the sins of the world. So what God did as a temporary solution, He allowed them to do what to kill the lambs, the bullocks, the goats. The blood was sprinkled. So their faith, in essence, had to go had to be in what they were doing. Lord, I have sinned against you, so I'm killing this lamb. All right, I'm killing this goat. Their faith had to be that God recognized that blood of that goat of that lamb who died in their stead. Now, the, the, the problem was the, the blood of goats, lambs, and bullocks was a temporary solution. It, in a sense, covered their sin, but it couldn't wash them away. It was a temporary thing. So that, that, their faith in the blood of those animals was actually in the faith of the Redeemer that was going to come later on. It's, it's still a faith thing. And this is what Paul is trying to get the, the, the Jewish people in particular to see. It is faith. It is not the law itself. All right. So uh, in, in, in as few words as possible, the law indicated what sin was. Yes. So it was, it, it was there to tell us this is a sin. It, it uncovered sin. This is exactly what sin is. Although, as Pastor said, it had no ability to keep us. So Christ came, thank God for Jesus, who came 
and died for the sins of the world that we don't we no longer have to have uh, bullocks and doves and different things like that but we can have a personal relationship with God the Father we, through his son Jesus right. and so I thank God for Jesus the blood of Jesus that now washes us clean so we are excited about the blood of Jesus if you do not have a Sunday school book we want you to open up to or turn to Romans chapter 10 verses 5 through 17 Romans chapter 10 verses 5 through 17 thank you sister Ruth Henry for sharing um, your Sunday your uh, homework from last week's if you are on zoom sister Henry went to the chat book and shared with us who she shared uh, with on last week so we thank God for that all right let's go to our first outline our first outline paul proclaims the gospel paul proclaims the gospel and that comes from romans chapter 10 verse 5 i don't know why they got one one verse in the first outline i'm going to go to the second one christ fulfills the law and i'm going to go ahead and do five through seven all right Futility of the law. Futility of the law. Verse 5, and then Christ fulfills the law. All right. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend unto heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead? All right, so the futility of the law. In other words, the law did not have uh, the power that we needed. The pastor has already so plainly uh, explained to us the law could not keep us from sinning. The law couldn't keep us from sinning. It simply indicated uh, what sin was so Paul comes <clears throat> as he be as he's talking to the Romans he begins to uh, look at Moses and he talked about the fact that Moses described the righteousness of the law that the man which doeth those things shall live by them so um, I, I, I can't help but read it he's, he's um, the description of pa Apostle Paul gives us of the righteousness of the law is written in Leviticus 18 and 5. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. Paul is speaking of God's command to the people to observe and keep the moral law. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's one thing that you tell us about, Pastor, about the difference in the moral law and what was the other one? The ceremonial well, law? ceremonial law. And then you had those laws that really dealt with the government of Israel. So, let, let's go a little bit further with this. You see, the law itself was really intended for the nation of Israel only because the nation of Israel was to be an example for the entire world to draw others to Christ. So you had all these laws. If you look, if you read Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, some of the laws told the king what he was to do, how judges were to, to conduct judgment, and so on and so on. There were health laws, all right, as to what they need to do. It went down to even to the point of what they were to eat and what they were not to eat, all right? Laws governed even their clothing even, what their clothing were to be made out of and so forth. So you had a lot of laws, then the ceremonial laws, the Sabbath day and, and all the feasts of the Lord and all of that they were to keep. Now all of it pointed to Christ. All of it had something to do as showing an example of what they were to keep when it came to the moral law. The moral law is, is basically contained within the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. All right, at, at least nine of them all right, within the Ten Commandments. And so the moral law, I don't want to get anybody confused, it still applies to us today. Like thou should not commit adultery. Thou should not steal. Well, you, you find all this in the New Testament. Right. And, and so the moral application law, it yet applied. It's just that now that we have Christ in our life, we have what that, that power to keep us, to, to uh, help us not to 
commit adultery, not to steal and other things that are spoken in the moral law. Now you mentioned that uh, nine of the Ten Commandments. Right. What is, maybe you want to tell us that the, one that is not. The one that is not really considered the moral law would be which, which, where the law said, remember the Sabbath yes. day and to keep it holy. And you find where Jesus dealt with that several times and it, it let us know that really that was more or less for Israel to keep which was uh, a commemoration for some things that have, has to do with Israel only, all right? So the law itself was never to be placed on other nations. And then once Jesus came uh, to, to die for the sins of the world, Jesus fulfilled the law, which meant that now, if we want to be saved, our faith had to be in Jesus, Jesus himself, and not in the law. Okay. Thank God for that explanation. Now, if we go to verses 6 and 7, uh, here Paul is quoting from Deuteronomy 30, 12 through 13. And he says, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into the heavens to bring Christ down or descend, uh, to, or ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up again from the dead. And what it's saying here, um, the righteousness of faith is not attainable by human actions. Yes. All right. Alone, we do not have to ascend to heaven. We do to or to launch into the deep to bring Christ and have Him revealed. Christ has already done the work at Calvary. He has already uh, died for us and put us in right standing with God when we accept Him by faith. We accept his righteousness. As we said last week, it's as if we are stamped righteous. And, and, and as Pastor has told us, that does not uh, nullify uh, our uh, requirement to live a saved life. Because he died on the cross does not say, okay, now you don't have to live a saved life. You know, all of that is covered by the blood. We can live whatever way we want to. As long as we, and, and I say that because many people teach that even today, that because of what Christ did on the cross, they feel like we can go, you know, as long as we come and we repent, say, I believe in the Lord, we move on and go on about our regular, our normal living, or that is our normal living outside of living a life that is uh, dedicated to Christ. And, and, and let me show you something. That's why. I God was angry with Israel many times under the law because they felt like once I kill this goat or this lamb and, and um, the, the blood is going to cover my sin, then I can go right back and do the same thing all over again. They made no effort to, to try to do any better or to have the faith in God, that, which actually came through the shedding of the blood of those animals. And, and so God said, I'm, I'm tired of your new moon, your feast, your sacrifice. They don't mean anything to me because you have nothing in your heart. See, it's a heart thing. Yes. And it had to be a heart thing even in the Old Testament. Yes. He, this brother's trying to say something right quick. I'm going to speak loud enough so we can hear you. All right. Uh, I tell you, we had to change our boys and goats. <laughs> and we had to change our boys and goats. And they will be in trouble. Amen. We will. Right. We would. You're correct. All right, so thank God we don't have to do that. Thank God for the work at Calvary. Uh, I like the way the author put it. He said, we often say it's not deep to underscore that an idea or concept is not complicated. This is what Paul is saying in these verses. It's not difficult or complicated to be saved. Because Jesus Christ has done the work on our behalf. All that's required is faith. We don't have to go to heaven or search the depths of the deep to find God. Jesus has already revealed himself and he paid the price for our sin. It's that simple. There's no mystery to salvation. Faith is a matter of the heart, like you just said. Only believe. And, and I want you to go back to the scripture where... Uh, Paul says, say not in thy heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep. So Paul said, you don't have to go to heaven where he is all right, to bring him down to be saved. 
or you don't have to go into the deep or the abyss to, to try to bring him up from there, all right, to be saved. Now, what, what would that look like in today's time? Well, some people, uh, this might be a little old, but some people thought at one time, I got to go out and find a, a three-leaf clove, four-leaf four clove. Four leaf clove. I think clove is a base of three leaves, mm -hmm. but I got to find a four-leaf clove, and that means that I've got to say, well, I need to see a spider doing something or go way out on the hill. All right, that's what I was about to say, Pastor. The song say, I'm looking for my Jesus way out on the hill right. now. You don't have to look I ain't for got to look for You ain't got to go to the hill. You don't have to go to the mountain. <laughs> All right. You don't have to go to the valley. All right. If, if, if wherever you are, if you simply seek the Lord and talk to him and in all sincerity, the Lord will save you. This is what this lesson is really talking about. And then let, let, let me go a little bit further because some people think, Okay, that when the Lord saved me, I have got to shout. I have got to cry. I've got to have a certain feeling, although we are emotional people. And when people get saved, many times they become emotional because they think about what God has done and he saved me and they start shouting. But you may have another person who's not really what you consider an emotional person, but they repented of their sins. And when they repented of their sins, without showing any emotion, they meant what they said and God saved them. And they, and they did not show any emotion. So it's not something that I've got to do. Now, I can go a little bit further. In some religions outside of Christianity, they believe that uh, they must beat their body into submission. You've seen, I think, maybe on television, Buddhist monks who take these uh, objects and, and they, they take their shirt off and they just, just whipping them back, just instead of whipping, just beating them back to they start bleeding and so forth. And they think that that's what's going to cause salvation. None of those things are going to cause salvation. You can't do anything on yourself. You simply have to believe. And that's what that's what people can't quite understand. All I got to do is believe and have faith in in what Christ has done, and the Lord will say. I like what Sister Patricia Barrett said. Our faith should cause us to be a living epistle for all to see. You cannot come in, into um, contact with Jesus, in real contact with him, and, and leave the same way you came. If you come into contact with him, you will be a changed person. Yes. All right? Our second outline, faith, not the law. That's coming from Romans 10, verses 8 through 13. Faith, not the law. And it reads, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth's confession is made, is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now these verses are telling us, it talks about uh, the word is neither even in thy mouth. And that is the word of faith that is spoken of. It said and in thine heart. Uh, and so... Uh, the, part, the pastor already told us it's a heart thing. And so even though it's a heart thing, there is still going to be this outward confession. If we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, then we shall be saved. So we have to believe that, uh, you know, some people are trying to go a different way. They're trying to get to heaven. They say there are a lot of paths to God. That's what they like to say. There are a lot of ways to get to heaven. No, you must come through Jesus. So, you know, you got this, this, this group of people who want to leave the name of Jesus out of everything, and they just want to say God because they say that covers everything. No, it doesn't. We realize that we must come through the Lord Jesus Christ. We must believe that he is the Son of God. We must believe in his death, his burial, and his resurrection in order to be saved. It's just that, that simple. Uh, and, and Paul begins to 
uh, he breaks that thing down. He say, because uh, for with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. So it's a hard thing. I have to believe in my heart. He say, but with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So there is a, some, a part of it that also comes from the mouth. And so he then begins to quote um, the scriptures again. I think these are taken from Joel uh, 2 and 32. And he says, um, uh, for the scripture says, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Then he goes on to, he wants to make it plain here. There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. God is a God over all. So I got news for those people who think that there's going to be a separate heaven for some or that some people are not going to heaven because of their ethnicity, because of their nationality. God is a God of all. So anyone who so, so you know, a lot of times people will take the last part of this verse and they'll just take that and say, you know, well, all you got to do is call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. But when you put this in context, what it is saying here is teaching us that whether you be Jew, Greek, whether you be black, white, whether you be, uh, uh, what, regardless of what your nationality is, when you call on the name of the Lord with sincerity, believe that he has, he has um, died, he's been risen, then you can be saved. So it's not so much that, you know, they take it and they just say, well, you know, all I got to do is call on the name of the Lord and I'm saved. There is a life that we still have to live. All right, Pastor. Okay. I mean, that's, that's what I have for this one. Okay. Well, I think you did a, a real good uh, job on this. And it was um, the verse that you said coming from Joel was the 13th verse. Whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you're I'm correct. sorry, yes, verse 13. You, you, you are correct. In what you said, uh, that a person must believe, all right? So it's more than just call on the name of the Lord. And when you say believe, you got to believe in him as a Savior. Yes. Then that faith has to go further. I've got to believe that when I call on him, that he will save me. Some people believe that, that believe in Jesus. For example, the Muslims, they, they believe in Jesus, but they don't believe he's the Son of God. Right. So then, if they don't believe he's the son of God, then they cannot believe in him as a savior. Right. Then some people believe that he is the son of God, but they will not go further to, to believe or to accept savior. him as savior or, and to believe that what? He will save me from my sins. They continue to live the same way they've been living all along. So we do have to call upon him to be saved, but we must also believe. And of course, here again, Paul is letting us know in this section here, the salvation is open to everybody, not just to the Jews. And, and that was a, a problem for the Jews uh, in that day uh, because the Jews, they, they, they just really thought this thing was for them only. You know, they really thought this was for them only. And, and if you are non-Jew, yeah, if you accept our ways under the law, then God will accept you. But you know what? They still, even if a non-Jew came and became a Jew, uh, I want to say, in their culture, not blood. Mm -hmm. they, uh, except in Judaism. Mm -hmm. That's the best way to say it, maybe. Uh, when they built the temple, there were certain parts of the temple that you were not allowed to go in. Because if you go look at the diagram of the temple, that was what you call the court of the Gentiles, where uh, non-Jewish people who, who trusted and believed in the God of Israel, they could only go there. They couldn't go any further. Then there was segregation between male and female because they had a quarter of the women. Women were not allowed in certain parts of the temple. So, you know, they, they had all these rules and regulations, segregation and so forth, uh, that uh, when you look at what Paul said, salvation is for everybody. All right. Sister Knight Jones is letting us know that they left off the last part of the um, yes. Outline, which is verses 14 through 17. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 17. They did not include that in the, uh, the explanation, the commentary of yes. our lesson. Yes. yes. Can I make a comment? Oh, absolutely, please. Um, I was just thinking, um, and just keeping back on what you two were saying, um, the confession is made unto salvation. 
that that's the easy part, I think, and that's why we see so many people confessing, you know, to be saved but not changing or still in their sins because they're not they miss that second part, believing in their heart. And that heart thing, that's that's where we uh falling off because I know I I grew up in the church and have been up to the altar and saying, Lord, forgive me for my sins. But I missed that part when, when I was believing in my heart. And when I start to believe that thing in my heart, my desires change. My uh, will change. I start giving my will over to God. And then I start seeing a change in my life. And I saw that I can live being sin-free and believing in God. But I think that's, that's the boat a lot of people is missing where they think they're saved because they confess and they're not changing what's in their hearts. All right, that's a good point. Very good point from Sister Knight Jones. Um, so yes, it's it's uh, as Pastor said when we say it's a heart thing. We when you really believe it in your heart that Jesus came and He died for my sins. How can we? The Bible say how can we continue therein? I I mean uh, it's like we, one scripture talks about crucifying Him afresh when we know that He has come and He has died. For the sins of the world. Matthew 1 and 21. I was talking. Uh, and I get in a lot of conversations. That's why I love the faith community that I'm in. On, uh, in different groups. Because there are some people who really want to know. And so they, they ask the question. You know about the purpose of Jesus coming. And so Matthew 1 21 tells us. That he came to save us from our sin. And I like the way evangelist Paz said. You can't be saved from something and still in it. He, he talked about the fact, you know, you think about a person, if, if, if you're out at sea and you, you've been thrown overboard. Yeah. And then somebody throws you a lifeline and, and saves you from, that, from drowning. If you have been saved from drowning, you're not yet in the water. You're not yet over there flapping and trying to, you know, do it on your own. And so that's the same thing. It is a hard thing. Sister Knight said, it's one thing to say, yes, I believe that Jesus is God. I met him out on the hill. You know, he, I know the man. You know, we've heard all of the phrases. But if when we really know him and when we really accept him in our heart, there is a change in behavior. It is manifest, as Sister Patricia Barrett told us earlier, it is manifest in the life that we live. So, um, yes, there is a, two parts here to this scripture. talks about believing in our heart. Pastor, you need to come on back now. <laughs> Believe <laughs> <laughs> Believing in our heart and confessing with our mouth. All right. So thank you, Sister Knight and Jones. Anybody else? Yeah, come on. Unmute and talk to us. We love it when you talk to us. Sister Patricia Bear say, Lord, give them the right understanding of accepting Jesus as the only way to salvation. Yes, that is our prayer. Come on, Sister Sharon. Somebody told me that one time. As a matter of fact, it was my brother. He said, uh, the Bible said, no man can pluck me out of his hand. I told him, no, no man can pluck you out, but you can get out of your own free will. He does not hold us hostage. Yeah. So, yes, uh, we, we, we know that just because, as Sister Knight said, you know, you go to the altar and you confess. You say, Lord, forgive me for my sin. But if you leave that altar and you continue in your old ways, then nothing has changed. And so the scripture tells us that there is a change. It, it describes a change. Yeah, and I think a lot of times when you had said they would do our homework, I thank God I shared the good news of Christ and the individual said they would come to church today. And Amen. I think about that because a lot of times when I sit to my saints, we do say what our mouth and we think that we say, but it's, Lord, change my heart. Yes. Change my heart. Yes. So I will Have proper understanding. 
Absolutely. All right, our last outline, verses 14 through 17, and they read, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. All right? So, you know, Paul, this is a continuation of verse 13, because he says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then he began to ask a series of rhetorical questions. He said, now, but how can they call on him in whom they have not believed? So we're talking about calling on the name of the Lord. He said, but you can't call on that name if you have not believed. You can't really call his name. And he said, he goes on to say, uh, and how can they believe in whom they have not heard? They have not heard about him. Then they can't believe in him. And then he goes on to say, and then they, they can't hear about him, except, you know, except through the preacher. And I tell a lot of people this. I was uh, in a conversation not long ago because the lady was telling me, you don't have to be a member of a church. And she said, I, I'm at home, you know, I stay at home. And so I don't, I don't have to be, a, I, and I began to tell her, well, how do you get past these scriptures that talk about the fact that, you know, talk about the preacher, talk about the fact that God gave us pastors according to our own hearts, who shall feed us. And I want to say that because, listen, in America, we think we can just have everything our way, not just at Burger King. We, we want to have our burger our way. We want to have salvation our way. We want to have church our way. We want to have everything our way. And we believe that because we believe it, it is so. Not so. The word of God dictates how we should live. And so it, Jesus himself instituted the church. And so the church, and when I say instituted the church, the, the church age, I guess you say, came uh, through him. But what I'm saying is this. All of these things were set up for the best possible outcome for the believer. When we come here, we do hear the word. How many times have you come to church and God spoke a word through the man of God? He does not deal with us the way he deals with his manservant. As a matter of fact, a young lady just told me last week, Pastor, you said something in the message. I had just been getting on her about coming to church, and you said something in the message, and she said, I knew when he said the Lord was talking to me. So, so many times, you know, we, if we sit at home and we just think all of these things of ourselves, and then, you know, we're not in a Sunday school, we're not in Bible study, we have no one to help us process our thoughts, help us understand these scriptures, how pastor is helping us on today. We can ask questions. We can give our thoughts. There is a reason for us coming together. How many times have we tried to get here to the people of God so that we could cry out to God in corporate prayer? So that we could get to the altar and cry out to God because the load was too heavy, the load of life. Sometimes the load of life gets too heavy. And sometimes all I want to do is to get to the believers, get to the saints so that we can pray together so I can hear that testimony. Listen, it is a blessing to have the preacher. The scripture goes on. I think this is a quote from, uh, from the Old Testament that talks about how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. You say Isaiah, yes. Nahum and Isaiah. Actually. Nahum and Isaiah. But he goes on to say, but they have not all but obeyed the gospel. Because Isaiah said, who hath believed our report? And so he says this, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Listen, you need to hear the word of God. You need to read it. Absolutely. You should have an individual prayer time or time that you read the scripture. But you need to hear from the man of God. All right. Pass what you got. Oh, that's it. Cause the time. Oh, I tell you something. Come on with us. And then you know I noticed something too. 
when uh, they say they don't want to come to church, I'm not putting my mouth on no lie. I'm, I'm just speaking in general. I know that when something happens, they call the pastor. Or they'll come being there, you know, they'll come out of that hurt, which that's good. But I'm saying that's a spiritual attack. Because the enemy don't want the people to come in there to the house of God. But there's deliverance in here. People are set free when they hear the gospel. It's a different thing when we didn't have church and actually coming back into the house of God. That's a different feeling. I mean, I, yes, yes. That's a Absolutely. And that's what the enemy don't want the people to really feel the presence of God because they know that in God's house, this is his house. And then he has uh, got a man after his own heart to tell the people to minister to them, but the enemy wants them to be dealt, don't want them to come in and be sent for Absolutely. I, I believe every one of us in here can remember a time that we've been healed yes. right here in the house of God. Yes, yes. We've been delivered. Amen. Many of us can. So, yes, it's good to, 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 to do all of those things at home, and you should. But none of those things substitute for the house of God. That's why the summer say, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Because he realized the benefits and dwelling in the house of the Lord. All right, let's talk about our homework. There are people all around who need to hear the good news of salvation. Determine to witness to someone in your family, on your job, or in your community. Pray and ask God to show you that, that specific whoever who needs a savior. Ask the Lord to help you to find the right time, the right place, and words to lead that person to salvation. All right, that is our homework for the week. We thank God for all of you. Thank God for the comments uh, from those of you who are on uh, Facebook, those of you who are on Zoom. Thank you for those great comments that you, that you gave us. Uh, I like what Sister Patricia Barrett said as I close out. We must compel people to come, hear the word. Our lifestyle is one way to draw them. God's word tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. So with that note, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. In other words, come to church. We'll be right here at 1030. We are still following the mandates of the CDC. We are socially distanced. We are uh, doing temp checks. We are doing everything we know to do. We are wearing masks. It is safe here. God bless you. God bless you. We'll see you at 10:30. We'll see you at 10:30.